So welcome everyone. We're so thrilled that you made it. Um, how, how do these squad showcases normally work? Well, first of all, squads are groups of individuals working on specific solutions to shared problems. We also have some teams in our community that work on more longstanding uh, chronic and general issues in the community. And a couple of those teams will be sharing with us today. If you are working on a project in a team, a squad, or another way that you would like to share with the community on a squad showcase, just reach out and we would really love to fit you in in the next monthly call. In general, the community support that our squads get come from the following people. And if you have any questions, please reach out to us at any time. Quick guidelines for our presenters today. Please respect your time. Uh, uh, different squads have different uh, time allocations depending on the amount that they have to present today. But in general, most squads will be limited to five minutes and we will need to keep you moving. So uh, if I need to cut anyone off, uh, apologies in advance, but we, we just wanna be respectful for the other presenters so that we can get through everyone. The main thing that our presenters need to do today is to help us see the big picture. Help us understand why what you're doing is useful and how people can start using it and use visuals. If you are not a presenter today and you're just here to listen, that's awesome. Please show the love, share your interest. Please comment in the uh, chat channels. We've got people watching the channels to see what kinds of comments and feedback are shared. The squads would love to hear from you. And we've got the contact information uh, with the talk IDs for all of the squad leads. And uh, please reach out to them with any feedback or questions after this as well. If you are wondering where to find the Zoom reactions, they are just under the participants panel in Zoom. And if you have any questions today, please post them in the Zoom chat. We probably won't have time for questions and answers, but what we will do is we will take a note of all the questions posted in the chat and we will try to get those questions answered afterwards and we will post them publicly on Talk. So we're going to get started today with the Analytics Engine Squad. So on that note, I'm going to hand it over to our Engine Squad leads, Alan and Bashir. Hi everyone. Uh, thank you for joining in. So today we are going just to cover the updates. Uh, sorry, let me move to a quieter place. Okay, and while Alan's doing that, I'll just briefly introduce this squad. Previously, this was known as our ETL squad. And what they are doing is they are trying to improve how OpenMRS data can be used for indicator reporting. Our main goal is to reduce the annoying unplanned technical member, a team member overtime that happens when you end up having to scramble and figure out your reports all over again. And we wanna make it easier to drill down to patient level data. We are considering different things such as uh, the performance, of the solution and its ability to generate real-time indicators. Alan, are you uh, in a better spot now? Okay, um, Bashir, are you able to take over? Um, uh, I guess, I mean, it, today is going to be mostly Alan presenting. I mean, I, I can go through the slides, but he has a demo, so. Sure. Yeah. Can you please walk us through your updates while I'm getting ready? Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah. So since uh, last time, uh, I guess um, last time we just gave the big picture that you know what we are doing is like a uh, like a se separate from OpenMRS. Uh, uh, we are trying to create the uh, some pipelines that read from OpenMRS through different. Uh, ways and then push the data in into a warehouse that can be used in a scalable fashion. Um, our first focus for the MVP is for one single instance, but uh, we are trying to build things such that you know we can actually um, we can integrate multiple instances of OpenMRS into a single uh, data warehouse. Um, so these are, I guess, mostly from uh, last time the high level points. Uh, right now we have, uh, so I, I am from Google, uh, but uh, um, the, one of the, uh, some of the, our main contributors like uh, Alan and Peter uh, are from Ampad and uh, iTech. So we just want to make sure that, you know, what we build is uh, usable in different scenarios, uh, not just this, this specific scenario. And for example, iTech scenario is, is somehow different than what I described. So I think we can go to the next slide. Uh, and Alan, please feel free to, uh, to interrupt me whenever 
you are ready to do, to take over. So this is from last time, and I guess we can just quickly go to the next slide because we covered this last time. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, so Alan will take over. Sorry. <laughs> can you go back briefly to the previous slide? So thank you, Bashir, for stepping in. So what we are trying to accomplish is in streaming pipeline is actually to extract data as it comes in real time, such that when a clinician enters data, we'll be able to stream that data down to our data warehouse. And we are currently supporting two modes of streaming. And one is based on atom feed module, and the other, the other one is based on the Bezium um, uh, component. So if any changes happens within OpenMRS or MySQL, we'll be able to capture it and streams it down the analytic data warehouse for downstream consumption. And uh, right now we are thinking of streaming, storing our data using either Parquet or Firestore. Go, go to the next slide. And we have started working on pipeline orchestration. We are trying to make it very simple for any implementer to adapt this pipeline. We've started with Docker Compose. And the good thing about Docker, Docker containers gives you the flexibility to specify resources and specify option in a very much, in a quick, quick and easy way. For example, on the right, we'll be able to specify, uh, for example, targeted parallelism depending with your server and specify other things such as um, server URL. It, it, is, it provides a very easier way of um, mapping your current instances to the current uh, uh, pipeline. So right now we are thinking of using Docker, uh, Docker containers. We have managed to do that. But in future, we might need to use uh, complex tools or uh, um, flexible tools such as uh, Apache Airflow and Leads. Let's go to the next. So today I'll be, I recorded, I pre-recorded the demo because of network issues. So I'll just play it in. It's a short uh, video. Great, thanks so much, Alan. Thank I will just share my computer sound here. The project contains four main subprojects. Batch, which can be used during bootstrapping for bulk extract. Streaming, which can be used to capture real-time incremental updates using Atom feed module. Streaming bin log, a real-time change data capture package based on the Bezium. And of course, the common package which contains common functionality that is applicable to the three other projects. Uh, both batch and streaming modes emit fire objects, but can be configured to generate REST API objects or extract rows and columns from targeted tables. So right now, I already have OpenMRS running. Uh, and you can see it's up and running. So what I'm going to do, I'll just start by firing up um, the batch pipeline. So remember to pass in the parameter to build it and build it from the source. OK. It should send 20 requests in parallel per endpoint. And you should see it hitting Google fast, although I haven't configured Google's fast. So we should expect an error. Yep. This is going to take about a minute or so because we have around 9,000 encounters. 
but I'm just going to uh, cancel it for now and move on to the next project. Uh, so next we're going to demonstrate streaming pipeline. Should be stopping. Yeah, it's definitely stopping. Good. The same command, uh, but passing in the sub project. Good. Uh, should read from the. Before I do that, let me cancel. Uh, let me delete the offset database such that we can be able to to stream it from the zero of data entry. So we should expect it to read or to stream in data from the zero of data entry. And uh, we should be able to see the logs for, right now it's streaming in encounters. It's going to take a few seconds to uh, finish streaming or to stream all the encounters rather. And as you can see, it's hitting the Google Fast, which we haven't configured, and that's why you can see the error. Um, it's not going to take long. Yep, it's done. So the next thing I'm going to do is to demonstrate real-time data entry, and we should be able to see more logs after this last log. So let's do that. Let me just quickly find a patient. Maybe though. Are we going to capture vitals? Before we send, mark this last message. We should see a new encounter. Encounter vital is normally encounter type seven, if I'm not wrong. Okay, so from so, so I'll try to be quick. That's it. Good. Yep, encounter set type seven. Okay, thanks so much, uh, Alex. We will uh, carry on to the other squads. Uh, I know that there were additional slides here. However, um, given that uh, you've already gone over time, we will continue uh, moving forward now. Others are welcome to look at the slides after. So um, on that note, uh, I will go ahead and open things up for the micro front end squad. This squad is working on making reusable front end modules. Uh, imagine if you could reuse front end modules that other teams created and um, imagine if you could try them out right away without being worried that those modules would crash your system. So to solve those, we've created a new UI framework for OpenMRS and it leverages modern JavaScript frameworks and microservice architecture. There's been a lot of updates over the last month so I'll hand it over to Eric, the technical project manager for one moment to just quickly summarize the updates and then we will see the team's videos. Were people able to hear me just now? Yeah, yeah I can hear you just Very well. Okay, well then on that note, I will uh, keep going here. <laughs> so over the last uh, month, we've um, been working really hard on three particular things. 
we've been working to make the platform itself easier to set up, excuse me, the front end experience, easier to set up and making the extensions configurable. You are going to see a demo of that in one moment. You, we've also been working really hard on what it would look like to have more intuitive design that, and also designs that we can get out the door faster uh, given our limited UX resources over time. And so we've done a lot of investigation into different style guides and you're going to see the impact of the new design system that we've tried to start using called Carbon Design. And finally, we've been working really hard on specific designs for a new front end for order entry and the patient chart workflow. So let's have a look uh, at what exactly has happened over the last month. And huge kudos to the micro front end squad who got their videos all ready to go. So I have them queued up on YouTube for us here. And if you would like to watch the videos again after this, you are more than welcome to. The links will be here and we will have them in a playlist for you as well. So I will get my uh, computer audio sharing. And if for any reason you can't hear the audio, please speak up or uh, message me on Slack. That would be awesome. Frontends. In the browser, we see a list of links styled as buttons on the home page. We're going to add a link to this micro frontends GitHub repo to this list and style it so that it resembles the rest of the buttons on the page. Heading over to the code, we'll create an extension slot in the home dashboard component right before the place where the other buttons are being rendered. We'll do so by calling extension slot react to find the extension slot, giving it a name, in this case, home page links. This then wraps a div, which provides the styling for the button. Home button. And then inside of this, we have the extension. We'll then create a new file called GitHub link. We'll paste in the definition for the extension. And then inside of our app's entry point, we'll, we'll provide the extension definition here. The app name is the name of the micro front end. And the name of the extension. And then we'll use the attach function to register both the extension and the extension slot name. Refresh the page and hey presto! Thanks to some CSS wizardry, we see our extension and extension slot helpfully highlighted on the page. Click the link and you're rightly transported to the GitHub repo. And that completes a quick look at the extension system. Thanks for watching. Hi, this is Brandon, and I'm going to demonstrate a couple new features of the configuration system for micro front ends. The first is that configurations are now configurable through a UI. If we open up the implementer tools, we find under the name of the module that we want to edit the configuration for, ESM Home App, uh, we find the default configuration that's presently in use, uh, buttons, a list of uh, non-extension buttons, and this enable parameter. We're going to change that um, oops, to false. And when we refresh the page, that piece of configuration will now be in effect. Um, we can clear that. And in the near future, we'll be able to download uh, that oh, configuration override so that it can be uh, provided in, as a version controlled configuration file. Opening up our configuration file over here, uh, we find the second feature, which is that the extensions that Dennis just demonstrated are actually some amount configurable. Um, so here under uh, ESM Home App, uh, under a special key called extensions, 
and under the extension slot name, um, for Dennis it was homepage buttons. Here it's uh, for him it was homepage links. For me it's homepage buttons. Uh, we have a, a few special keys available to us, so we're going to try and remove the reports link button here. I save the file, refresh the page, and it's gone. Uh, and then we're going to reorder uh, these two links, uh, capture vitals and registration link. There we go. Capture Vitals is the first patient registration, and all of the ones that weren't specified in the order array come following. That's all. Hi, this is Samuel from Mecom, and I will be demonstrating how to configure the patient uh, submission redirect target, or what we can call where the user will be redirected after registering the new patient record. Uh, uh, I'll use the implementer tools to demonstrate how to configure this and uh, this is configured through the submit property uh, uh, which is under uh, the links uh, property links property of the patient registration app configuration schema uh, by default the default behavior is to redirect to uh, to to redirect to the uh, patient chat uh, for micro front ends. Uh, let's say uh, we want to demo, uh, we want it to redirect somewhere in core apps. Uh, uh, I will uh, put, I'll override this and I, I put such a link, such a URL. Uh, uh, notice it's open rice base slash for apps uh, on patient UID and they save. Uh, I just out of curiosity, I'll refresh this page that my configuration is to be sure my configuration is picked up and I'll register this patient. And that's it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Donald. Uh, so in this video, I'm going to talk about uh, how Ampath is able to use micro front end uh, to be able to serve our clinic dashboard. So whatever you're seeing on my screen is where we are hosting uh, our micro front end. That is a uh, ESM dash, uh, clinic dashboard. This is where we host reports majorly about uh, uh, a particular clinic. So this is a monorepo, a Lena monorepo repository, uh, which was set up for us by Florian. Uh, so, so far we've been able to complete uh, two reports, the OVC report and uh, cross-border report. So we've been able to move one report that is the cross-border report production. So currently our users are able to make use of this uh, reporting framework that we've implemented. So the main motivation of having uh, this micro front end on uh, our application is to enable us to have a, a smooth transition or migration path uh, from uh, whatever we have at the moment. We are using a uh, Angular application. So we intend to migrate from Angular to the new OpenMRS uh, single spa uh, app that uh, we are currently developing. So I'm going to do a small demo of uh, whatever I've been able to achieve. Uh, so I'll switch to our, our current uh, application. So we are able to consume this micro front end within our Angular application. So I'm going to log in and then move to our clinic dashboard where we're able to access uh, this uh, report. So when I expand the site navigation bar under the monthly reports, we're able to access this cross-border report which is implemented using a, a, <coughs> a single spa. Now when I open this uh, report here, you're able to access uh, uh, these filters. So when you click on the generate report for the, for the month of September, uh, you're able to generate uh, this report. So here we have these indicators, uh, cross-border patients, uh, international travels, 
uh, HIV cascade, TB cascade, and uh, the numbers that we have. So whenever you click on this one indicator, it, uh, it takes you to the patient list that uh, uh, so when you look at uh, cross-border patients, who are these cross-border patients? So when you click on this indicator here, you are navigated to this particular cross-border patient patient list. So here we have these particular uh, patients. So at the bottom you have uh, the total number of records and uh, you're able also to download a CSV version uh, for this. So that is pretty much uh, whatever we've been able to achieve. So one takeaway thing for us uh, is that uh, we've been able to implement this on our production system. So whatever you're seeing here is uh, test data uh, that is currently being served on our production system. Yeah, that is uh, pretty much. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ronald. So in this video, I'm going to talk about the work I've been doing on incorporating carbon styles into our application. That is the OpenMRS bar. So when you look at the current uh, app that we have uh, we have this global navigation bar uh, it has a white background at the top of our screen i've uh, been trying to implement it uh, according to whatever we have in our design so when you look at this new design it uh, implements the global navigation bar uh, in carbon styles so it is pretty much in the early stages so i'll uh, show a demo so when you look at uh, Whatever I have on the screen is that uh, we have this uh, new global navigation bar. So we have this uh, uh, burger menu here at the right side, and then on the left, <coughs> we oh sorry, on the left we have this user and the location pin. So when you click on this uh, user icon here, you're able to access this option to log out from uh, the app. And uh, when you try and uh, click on this. Uh, <clears throat> location pin here you're able to change the location that uh, you're currently logged in at yeah so this is uh, pretty much in the early stages i will continue working on it so that uh, we can be able to have a global navigation bar uh, looking at this here yeah thank you okay Thanks so much, everyone, for listening to that. So um, if you're wondering what on earth you just saw, in summary, we showed you our new extension system and the new configuration system and how you can do configuration through a UI and through the dev tools. We also showed a real world use of how uh, Ampath is using single spa for their clinic dashboard reports. And we showed you how we've started integrating carbon design in the global navigation. And finally, we are going to hear from the UX designer on the squad, uh, Kieran, and he's going to walk us through the latest order entry and design work that's been going on. If I can get uh, YouTube to cooperate here. There we go. Hi, my name is Kieran. I'm a UX designer and I've been working on the order entry flow of OpenMRS for the past couple of weeks. Today, I'm going to show you um, the new concept for navigation in OpenMRS, as well as the order entry flow, which we've been testing with users in Kenya and Haiti um, for the past little while. All of the different sections in OpenMRS are held in this right bar. Um, and the left navigation is used to jump between pages within those sections. So now we're in the um, patients section and we're looking at John Wilson's orders um, page. And so let's take a look at the flow for ordering uh, medication for a patient. Um, we can see all of John Wilson's past medications here. Uh, this is five of 10 in a list. So we can uh, move between the list within the same screen like this. And currently, John Wilson has no active medications. So let's pretend we want to prescribe um, some aspirin for the patient. So we can do that by moving to the order basket. Uh, so this is a bottom drawer, which means I can move back between uh, other parts of the app quite easily. Um, and I can see what's already been ordered um, during this visit. So let's say we want to add uh, aspirin, then I can search 
for it here and I get my search results. Um, we can see a collapsed version of the patient's information, including his weight and allergies. Um, and with the search results, I can, um, in an express workflow, uh, tap the icon to add it to the basket and continue searching for other um, orders. Or uh, I can tap anywhere on the search result to move to the order form. Uh, so let's do that. Let's move to the order form, which is divided into two sections, the dosage instructions and the details of the prescription. And again, we have our uh, reminders of the patient's weight and any allergies uh, above. Um, so let's change the frequency to once uh, daily and all these other um, parts of the instructions can be edited as well as the prescription duration. Uh, I'll see the quantity that's dispensed. And so now that it's saved, I see it in the order basket and the incomplete label has been removed. And uh, now I'm ready to sign the order. And once it's signed, I see that the medication has been ordered with this notification and it appears in the patient's active uh, medications. Okay, thank you so much to the Microfinance Squad team. Great to see what you're working on. So a quick mention about the Open MRS Academy Squad. Jen, would you like to just say a word and then we'll move on? Yeah, just really quickly. Um, the Open MRS Academy Squad has been working this year on building more, uh, uh, expanding our library of educational materials in Open MRS through Open MRS Academies. They've developed um, a concept note that outlines four different OpenMRS academies. They've built out materials for the first one, the OpenMRS Academy Fundamentals, uh, which targets newbies. And I'm making this quick because today marks the last day of the OpenMRS Academy Fundamentals pilot. So they were piloting this in Mozambique. Um, the pilot started on Tuesday, it ends today. So we hope that at the next squad showcase, the OpenMRS Academy squad will have much more to share um, as we'll debrief the pilot and then be talking about our goals for the next year and the coming month. Awesome, thanks Jen. Over to the QA teams. Hello, um, hello everyone. So uh, for QA team, we've been working on uh, setting up processes and tools for the community. And we have two slogans in which we'd like to make sure we uh, leave out with this is that quality is, uh, is a responsibility for everyone and quality assurance doesn't have to come at the at the end, but should be start, uh, but should begin at the but should be at the beginning. So uh, we can move on to the next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, a few need to know about the OpenMRS QA. The quality assurance framework is based on Cucumber, uh, framework which uh, is supporting a number of automated uh, automation uh, tools. Uh, we have Selenium and Cypress um, as proofs of concept. So if you click on the links um, on your own time, you'll be able to see the different um, GitHub repos uh, just demonstrating those two. Uh, the next thing is just to highlight Cucumber Studio is a collaborative uh, test management app. So which means that business analysts and developers can work together. If you'd, like a, if you'd like to be able to access and see what we have in there, just uh, send me your email address and I'll make sure you have access to the system and the various repositories. Uh, the other key thing to mention is that uh, it's, uh, we've been able to do a CI Cucumber Studio integration. This is whereby if we're doing automated test, uh, we're doing automated test runs and you get the results in CI, we're able to translate that in a version in which stakeholders, business analysts can be able to see and the link there also provides access to that. Then we've also developed uh, some guidelines, uh, SOPs and tools different teams can use in terms of improving their quality assurance. Uh, if you click on that link, you'll get access to our templates, get the process that you need to follow. And if you have any questions or you need any support, we are here to help. And the last but not least, in case you missed any of our sessions, let's say that where we described it to detail what we've done, I've put in a link to the recording to help you catch up. Next slide, please. 
uh, focus uh, for this month is having done all the work we've done for the past year, we want to make sure that we can uh, implement this and work for the reference application. So this month we're focusing on the reference application testing 2.1.2. 2.11.0 testing process. Uh, what we are trying to make sure we do is uh, make sure that we are able to help support the release manager to ensure there's adequate end to end testing and that we uh, make sure that we can plan very well in terms of time, uh, making sure there's uh, adequate uh, resource, uh, resources in terms of testers, and of course, uh, improve the process by making sure we add any new testing materials or in terms of test cases, test data, or even in, we are lacking enough some automation uh, for the reference application. Milestones, uh, we, are hope, we are hoping to almost achieve a bug free. I know it may not be possible, but we can aim for that. And of course, successfully, this will be our first uh, attempt in integrating all the tools that we've developed for quality assurance within this particular release. So we want to see that through. Uh, what we are hoping to get is we're hoping we could get some community members to help us write more test cases in Cucumber Studio in form of gacking uh, for the appointment module so that we can go taking off and uh, updating our obsolete material. So if you're up for the challenge, please let me know. And thank you. Great. Thank you, Christine. Okay. Moving on to our project management team. Uh, so our project management team meets every week and we review the technical needs in the community and we try to plan out the releases and the resources that are going to be needed for the platform, the ref app, and we coordinate other projects as well, like the Google Summer of Code. Uh, so some quick updates coming from that team. We are working on the platform release 2.4 and that's addressing a number of problems largely related to upgrading core libraries, adding support for PostgreSQL, MySQL, different versions as well as different versions of Java. We're also introducing the Fire 2 module into the core. If you'd like to uh, look for more information on talk about Postgres or our API endpoints, there are links here as well, which will be provided in both a follow-up email and talk post after this call. And we are aiming for um, the alpha to be out, uh, oh, is out, <laughs> and the full release uh, next month. The Ref app release uh, 2.11, this is going to be running on platform 2.3, uh, 0.2. And we are, we've also removed some of the COVID-19 concepts that were included in the last release so that we can continue cater them to a separate COVID-19 concept starter package. There's been additional work on Ansible, Docker Compose, and updating MDS Builder. We've also got a testing sprint for this that's ongoing. If you are interested in helping to test this new release of the Ref app, please reach out to the release manager, Sharif, on talk. And uh, finally, um, the release deadline that we're working towards essentially for a beta of this is the 1st of November. And if you're interested in understanding which uh, the latest versions of the modules will be, there is a link to a page that documents all of that here. The OCL for OpenMRS squad. We have had an interesting month. The vision for the squad is that there is no more starting your dictionary or concept management from scratch. If you can imagine building a dictionary for your implementation once and then being able to reuse that across any implementation and share that with any other organization, you'd have no more painful migration script management. So uh, <clears throat> in the past month, since our last update to you, we did successfully release our MVP of OCL for OpenMRS. And this makes it easy to find and use public, organizational, or personal dictionaries that you've put together. You can quickly combine and customize concepts, and you can also reuse existing concept work from other implementations or organizations. So, um, oh, I think the slide did not update, but that's all right. So, um, MSF is actually using the MVP for a new implementation that they have in Bangladesh, and so far things are going well. Our next steps. We are working to improve the usage of concept uh, customization for local examples. Like let's say um, in CL there's a certain concept uh, that you want to use, but you need to change even just the capital letters. How do you do that without recreating concepts all over again? That's a problem that we'll be tackling soon. If you are an engineer with, uh, or developer rather, with React experience who is interested in either growing your React skills or contributing to this project, please get in touch with me at Grace 
and we would love to hear from you. If your organization would like to try out the MVP, we would also love to hear from you. If you would just like to play with the software, well, we're kind of running out of time for other teams here, so I will keep going. But if you'd like to try it out, our demo is public, and here is the login and password information. Um, simply click this link, and it will take you straight to our demo site, where you can walk through the experience of finding concepts uh, and editing them. And I'll hand things over to the fire squad. Hello, um, this is Christina. Um, so I think you can move to the next slide. I'm just gonna give updates and then uh, demo. So the problems we're solving are interoperability using a standards, the standard fire. Um, we're building tooling to support data exchange for lab. Um, what, we're, what we've just produced is a prototype for the MPI SHR work. And then there's also some parallel work going on with reporting. Um, so let's just move it straight into the demo. Oops. So can you all see my screen here? Yep, looks good. Okay, so so here so so in Haiti we're implementing a continuum of care architecture that includes OpenCR, which is a Happy Fire based um, master patient index client registry. And then um, we're using a standalone Happy Fire JPA server as a shared health record. So we have um, on the left here our Isante Plus instance, which which is an OpenMRS based system, system that uses the atom feed pipeline to pipeline that all the data into a side by side happy fire server and then that that information is used to update the shared health record and then also used um, to query other instances can query the mpi for matching patient information and pull shared health records from the from the national level so here's a, a demonstration of the prototype that we've built. For this demo, we'll be taking a look at an already existing patient called Rafael Lesai. This patient was created in one of the Isante Plus instances and has a bit of a made up um, medical history. We will take a look at this patient and then import him in the second Isante Plus instance. And then uh, download the continuity of care document based on that patient's medical history and view it in this instance. We will then add a couple of additional um, items to the medical history and see those changes reflected when we download the CCD back in the instance that the patient was originally created. Okay, so let's get started. Oh, and like I said before, uh, if you want to run through this demo by yourself or want any more information, I will share this link uh, after the video. Okay, so we have Rafael created in um, isanteplusdemo.com and we want to import the same patient in our second Isante Plus location. So we go to that location, go to register a patient, and start typing their name. We can see that the generated patient gets uh, found and that they can be imported. So let's import Raphael. And now that the patient is imported, we can uh, get the continuity of care document for that patient by pressing the import button under the continuity of care section. When we press that button, all of the associated patient records um, from the master patient index are queried and 
then all the, those patients' medical histories that are saved in the shared health record are compiled into the CCD that gets downloaded. So if we go to the registration summary and now uh, view the continuity of care document that was uh, loaded um, a minute or so ago, we can see this patient's uh, medical history um, from encounters to allergies to different medications that either they have requested or are taking and other types of uh, medical conditions. On the bottom, you can see um, vital signs that were recorded. So this is a um, this is a document based on the standard standard structure defined in the international patient summary specifications. Okay, now that we can see view the patient's medical history in the second. Um, instance of Isante Plus, let's go back and add to this history. So let's find our patient again and maybe add a allergy for aspirin. And maybe just another one for some fish. Now let's go back to the patient chart and start a visit for this patient. Maybe add a lab order for this visit. CD4 count and um, maybe platelets and a red blood cell count. So we can see that um, this uh, lab request is submitted and we can end the patient's visit. And if we go back to the patient chart, we can see that the allergies show up here. Now let's see if this information um, gets loaded into the um, shared health record and provided to uh, the other Isante Plus instance in the form of a CCD. If we go to the original uh, Isante Plus location where the patient was created and where most of the medical history resides. We can go to the registration summary page and import the continuity of care document. And then view the document. And as you can see, um, the allergies that we added um, show up right here. You can see that the this most recent encounter, the analyse de lab, um, was is showing up in the encounters. And if we go to the results, we can see that um, we can see that there are two sets of um, lab results that were requested. Um, with this one being the most recent one. And that's it for the demonstration. Um, thanks for listening, and let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much to the Fire Squad for walking us through that. Next on our list is the COVID Squad. Uh, so. 
as we mentioned in the last showcase for the first few months of this squad, while, well, while the whole world was learning about COVID, we were a collaboration hub and there was quite a bit of work uh, going on around feedback and collaborating on setting up forms and new workflows given the new COVID care requirements. And you can learn more and, and see a bunch of tools that we put together from concepts to sample forms and so on here on the uh, COVID Squad homepage. Now what we're working on is imagine a world where you had a more robust and easier to set up OpenMRS to DHIS2 pipeline that doesn't need manual code fixes every time there's a change to reporting indicators, because we all know that happens. And we also know that reporting standards are coming for COVID and we can expect to see more reporting requirements around the corner. But even uh, amidst COVID, we also want to make sure that the improvements that we do can be used to help people with their existing um, program reporting, including HIV, TB, and future pandemics. If you would like to uh, join us in this work, you're welcome to join our weekly calls on Wednesdays uh, or contact any of us mentioned here. So in the last month, we've been focusing on some MVP work that we wanted to do. Originally, we were focused on upgrading the DHIS2 reporting module, trying to make it easier to set up and exchange, uh, sorry, update data sharing from OpenMRS to DHIS2 in a way that would prevent people from having to go through and manually change their code for disaggregate or aggregate reports. So in the last month, we did some work around uh, importing data sets, so those don't need to be written manually. Nothing's hard coded. Uh, the, all the metadata is stored in, in the database so that uh, you can use a GUI to map the OpenMRS indicator, and that can be done at any time without having to do a release. And we also use code values instead of UIDs. We implemented support for all period types, and we also uh, have some support for mapping the OpenMRS locations with the DHIS2 organization unit codes. Um, however, after, after doing all that uh, MVP work, we realized that it would be more helpful if we built on top of the existing DHIS2 connector module, because this is already being used by a number of implementations. So over the course of the next month, we are shifting our focus to taking the work that we did and learned from in the reporting module, uh, excuse me, the DHIS reporting module, and we will be building that into connector. So stay tuned, and if you'd like to join us, if you have an interest in DHIS2 integration or the connector module or open him, we would be very interested in working with you. If you are a site who would like to, uh, who is experiencing pain points related to getting your data into DHIS2, we would love to hear from you. Please reach out to us. If you'd like to see a short video about uh, that initial MVP work that was done, uh, we have a video here for you. Please have a look uh, after. This will be available in the slide deck and this will walk you through those updates. This is the same video that we showed last month. We've just done a number of things uh, in the code in the background. We wanna do a quick spotlight on a squad that over the course of the last month had to make some hard decisions. And we, we get asked regularly, how do decisions get made at OpenMRS? So we wanted to share this as an example. We chose to try out the carbon design system in the micro front end squad for the front end work. This was a decision that admittedly could have big future implications for OpenMRS as a community because it means shifting away from our traditional uh, style guides. So how did we make this decision and how did we share that process with the community? So here's what we did. Um, first, we introduced the issue. We used talks to explain the dilemma and the problems uh, that we were experiencing with the style guide that we were using. We did multiple deep dive sessions and public posts to try to understand the pros and cons of different approaches and the different options that are out there. And you can actually see our documentation about what we learned along the way in those different presentations and in the research we did in uh, a detailed documentation page about why choose a style guide or design system, especially an external one. We presented to the TAC, the Technical Action Committee, so we provided regular updates. And then once we thought we had a good decision based on our deep dive conversations with the, with, that were publicly open, uh, we then shared that with the TAC and uh, essentially got sign off that it seemed like a good thing to pilot. But the most important final piece is that uh, the squad is committed to following up with the community. So as you saw today, we are very much trying this out. And you saw one of the videos where we started integrating the carbon design system into our technology. And we'll continue to share our experience with the community. And if the squad finds that it was a useful tool, we will provide follow-up uh, workshops and training. 
If you saw something interesting today, please contact the squad or the leads with your feedback. They would love to hear from you. And we'd also love to hear from you if there's a squad you are interested in joining. And finally, we are always looking for implementations that we can help. We are here to support care activities. So if your implementation or site would like to pilot any of the uh, solutions that you saw today, please do reach out to us. We are here to support you. Some quick wrap up announcements. The next squad showcase, since they are monthly, will be at the end of this month on the last Thursday on October 29th at the same time as today. We are also working towards an implementers showcase. During the squad showcase, you hear from the community, but the community would like to hear from implementers. We want to make sure that what we're working on aligns with what implementers need and what you are currently working on and what your priorities are. And we would love to hear from you at that time. So please reach out to me if you are interested in that as well. I want to give a big thank you to everyone who joined us today. Thank you so much to all the presenters. I know a lot of work went into your preparation. Thank you. And I wish everyone the best for the rest of their day.